We haven't even started the class. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming to class. We had about 300, almost 400 people register for the class. 365, 375 people. This is how to perform a home inspection class. Number 25, I'm Ben Gromyko from Interachi. And um, what we're going to do is inspect this house. It's a townhouse, end unit. Um, it takes me about mm, two to two and a half hours to inspect a, a home like this. And we'll go through um, how I inspect a home. I want to share how I inspect a home. Maybe you can glean some valuable information from that. Um, we're going to learn how to inspect a house according to the standards of practice. We're going to figure out how to find defects, and we'll find some defects in this house. We'll talk about how to pace your home inspection. You don't want to waste your time or your client's time. And we'll talk about branding and marketing and how to write an inspection report. We're having a convention, a professional inspector's convention in Atlantic City. Um, and let me take you there. Here's the natchi.org slash convention URL. So bookmark this, write this down. Let me take you there. Natchi.org slash convention is where we describe where we have our convention. So let me move this over. So it's called the 2018 Professional Inspectors Convention, uh, April 29th to May 1st in Atlantic City, New Jersey. There's uh, about 150 days left. And this is the amazing price. It's free for members. So if you are a member and you want to attend the best home inspector convention in 2018, um, it's free. Uh, for everyone else, it's a few hundred bucks. And we have a, a tentative schedule for the event, and it's at the Resorts Casino Hotel um, in Atlantic City. And it's a really nice place, actually. Uh, beautiful right on the beach. And we'll be having our opening reception in that restaurant right on the beach, and the resort is behind it. So it should be a lot of fun. So make sure you uh, attend and register. Oh, there's um, we just put it up, so... We're going to have some updates as we build the convention and get some details about presenters. So click that button and get updates. But it is free for Internet Chief members. Um, a couple URLs before we get into the inspection. Natchi TV, that's where you are. Um, we provide free online live classes. Natchi.org slash everything is where you should go, whether you are a new inspector or veteran inspector. We try to put everything there that is essential for success for a home inspector. So go to natchi.org slash everything. It's 15 steps, a step-by-step -step process. Natchi.org slash SOP is where our standards of practice is. So go to our standards of practice, and that is the foundation upon which you build your inspection service. You follow the standards of practice. It's, it's a, um, you build your process upon what is required and not required according to the standards of practice. Um, you define things like defects according to the standards of practice. Um, you write your inspection report that should reflect the standards of practice. So it's really important. And it all starts there. And it gets continually updated uh, annually we review the standards of practice. We may tweak a few things uh, to keep up with the industry um, demands and changes. So um, try not to, I would recommend not copy paste and put the standards of practice in your inspection report, but have a live link or do both. Have a live link to the uh, live online document. So the, we're gonna find some defects. This is a major defect in the home. Uh, There's another defect. And there are several types of defects, but first, I want to ask you a question. So I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? Hope you can. This is a, a question I want to ask. What type of defect is described in the standards of practice? What type of defect is described in the standards of practice? Like, hmm, is it major, minor? 
material or cosmetic? What type of defect is described in the standards of practice? Major ones, minor ones, material ones, or cosmetic ones? All right. A lot of you are voting. I see some good answers. Keep going. We'll close the poll in just a few minutes, uh, seconds, sorry. I'll give you a five, four, three, two, one. All right, let's take a look. So, the type of defect that's described in the standards of practice is material. And when you say material, it isn't like um, cloth or steel. Uh, material means really bad, right? Um, ma major, minor, cosmetic, these are not described in the standards of practice. So in the standards of practice, go to that link, natcha.org, SOP, and read the standards of practice. There's only one type of defect that's described in the standards of practice. It's material. So a material defect is something that will um, have an adverse impact on the value of the home or has, um, will, will, is threatening some, will threaten someone's life, will really hurt someone. So it's like um, an example would be um, a deck that's about to collapse, a collapse that's eminent because the deck flashing is missing and there's rotted wood at the ledger board and you can feel the deck is loosely attached to the house. That is a material defect. Um, a flue from a fuel burning furnace where the connection pipe goes in, uh, there may be a thimble where you can look to see and it's blocked, where the chimney is blocked and you know when you turn this heating system on, it's going to backdraft carbon monoxide and hurt people, right? Um, when you go in and um, there is um, fire damage or mold, uh, water damage in the basement, um, the entire basement is just filled with water damage and, and mold. You know, that has an adverse impact on the value of the home. Um, there are other types of defects that are defined in the InterNACHI glossary that may help you. You don't have to use them, but they are defined to kind of help you gauge and communicate the degree of severity of the defects that you find. So a, um, a stain in the carpet is different from the deck ledger flashing, right? Stain in the carpet is a cosmetic defect. It's like a blemish or a flaw. Um, something that's gonna hurt someone is a material defect, right? A major defect would be like the sink. So this doesn't have an adverse impact on the value of home. It's not really going to hurt anybody, but it's a defect that should be fixed. If you let it go, it's going to leak, cause damage to the cabinet, maybe cause some mold, maybe damage the flooring, things like that. Minor defects. So a major defect like that sink um, is something that would um, require a professional contractor to come in and fix something a little bit beyond the, the skill set of a typical homeowner. A minor defect is something that a homeowner could replace or fix or hire a contractor to do, like um, a thermostat. If you go into a home and it has an old thermostat, manual thermostat, and you wanted to upgrade it, right? that could be done by a homeowner. The instructions on thermostat are actually written for homeowners to do. Low voltage, no one's going to get hurt. right? But you can hire a contractor too. But a material defect is written in the standards of practice, and you should take a look at that standard. Let me ask you one more question, okay? So is a home inspector required to find, sorry, not for find, is a home inspector required to find every defect in a house? Is a home inspector required to find every defect in a house? It's yes. No, not sure how to answer that, or maybe it all depends. Is a home inspector required, required to find every defect in a house? 
after our little discussion about the standards of practice, you should probably answer this one correctly. This is an easy one. All right, we're going to close in eight, seven, six, five. So vote, 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 two, one. Okay. So is a home inspector required to find every defect in the house? No. Uh, most of you got all that right there. That's correct. So a home inspector doesn't have to find every defect in a home. Um, I would say most defects, if I had to guess, most defects are hidden from view. Um, there's some kind of visual barrier, restriction, access is blocked, or obviously you just can't see through walls, can't see under the carpet, right? So most problems are only discovered after you live in the home for a while. So you're not required. If you know that and you're communicating with that and you set the expectations of your client with that, that you're not there to find every defect, then it kind of relieves a lot of burden, right? That you may be carrying. Now you're kind of free to do a great inspection, collect data that your client wants to know and sell it, provide it in a quick and easy, concise fashion, right? You're not there as a code inspector to find all the code violations. You know, a lot of existing homes that are, what, 10, 15 years old have code violations simply because of when they were built. They were built to code back then, but codes change. Almost every three, five years, they change significantly. So you're not required to find those code violations. You're not required to find every defect. You are required to find every defect that you deem to be material and that you observe. You have to, it's both. There may be a material defect that you don't see. Well, you're not required to report that because you just didn't, didn't observe it during your home inspection. There are many instances where that may occur, but you are required to report and communicate to your client those material defects, those defects that you deem to be material really bad, serious, this is going to hurt someone or have an adverse impact on the value of the home, and you observe them during your home inspection. Those two things, yep, you're supposed to report that. So let's perform this inspection, okay? Shall we? Major, 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 major video. Okay. All right. Looks like everything's working on my end. Hopefully you can hear me and see me. Let's inspect this home. So. When I schedule a home inspection, I schedule it at 8 o'clock or 12. That gives me four hours in between. 8 o'clock, mm, I'm going to get there early, about 7.30. I get there early because, well, where I'm from, if you show up on time, you're late. So I show up early. I leave my house at about 7, usually, drive for an hour or so and get to the house. So, you know, hopefully it's quick traffic. I'm there early. But my, my client is expecting to show up at 8 o'clock and everything starts. Well, I'm going to get there early. Why? Because I'm going to jump on the roof if I can. I'm going to inspect the roof. You're not required to walk upon any roof surface. You're not required to carry any ladder. You're not required to fly a drone or use a spectroscope, right? But you are required to inspect the roof, if you can, from several vantage points. You can use binoculars from the ground, from a window, from a, you know, maybe you can get to the gutter edge, the eaves, the rake board, something like that. But you're not required to walk upon any roof. If you can't see the roof, you should disclaim that to your client, that we didn't even see the roof, right? It's, it'll help reduce your liability as well to, di to disclose your inspection restrictions. For me, I carried tall ladders. I drove a really big van, big ladder rack, big ladders, a 40-foot um, a aluminum, 28-foot, 32-foot fiberglass, 12-foot aluminum, crawl gear, so step ladders, attic ladder, ton of ladders. So I, that's, I exceeded the standards of practice, and I tried to walk upon every roof surface. So you're allowed to exceed the standards of practice. It's recommended that you exceed the standards of practice in the same fashion for every client. 
and that was part of my brand as well. So to beat my competition in my market area, I wanted to provide an enormous amount of value so that my clients perceived hiring me as very valuable. Not just because I collected the same information that you're going to collect, but I also had other value points, other reasons to be hired. So one of the other reasons to be hired, we're both inspecting the roof, right? right? But, but my competition stood on the ground. I carried tall ladders and I got up on the roof, right? And I wanted to make sure that my clients knew that. So I'm inspecting the roof. This is in the morning, 7.30, 7.45, and I inspect all the roof surfaces. And I take pictures of everything that I inspect. I typically take a picture of the ridge, turn around, ridge, and then every plane and surface from afar and then from a medium distance and then up really close. That's my up-close shots. When I get up close, I put my hand in the photo. It becomes a part of a, my process. My camera, which now I would use my mobile device, um, forces me to take pictures and video of everything, but also forces me to get up close as well. If you take a picture like this, your client may not know what they're actually looking at. It's silly. You and I know, but your client may not know what they're actually looking at. It looks kind of brown and checkered. But if you put your hand up again, then your hand provides scale, right? So that's why. And there's my shoes, my soft shoes. I told you I took pictures of my shoes. And this picture is probably you know one of my best shots, or maybe this one, or this one, so that this picture goes into my inspection report, not because it's a cool shot, but because, and you know, it's accurate, I'm showing the condition of the roof surface, um, it's part of my brand. So when someone other than my client is reading my inspection report, I want them to understand my brand. Part of my brand, well, my brand is who I am and what I do and why I'm different from all the rest. So I want my inspection report to communicate that brand. So I put those pictures in the report. That's a great shot. If you're on the ground and you're my competition, I'm probably gonna beat you. Now you have a problem. You have an inspector who's a, your competitor who exceeds the standards of practice and puts pictures like that in his or her inspection report. What are you gonna do to beat me in the market? There's many things you could do, many things you could provide, a ton of extra value opportunities that you can give to your clients, right? To beat me in the market. But that's what you should think about, right? Check out your local chapter, check out your competitors' websites, and see what they do, and figure out how you can do better. If the perceived value of hiring you far exceeds the cost, then that's a good decision that your client is going to make, right? If the perceived value of hiring your uh, hiring a local inspector is um, you know kind of close to the cost, then you've got a problem, right? That inspector has a problem. The perceived value should far exceed the cost. So that is part of my inspection process. While I'm inspecting. I'm also confirming the reason why you hired me. That's part of my brand. You hired me to do things like this. I'm actually touching the main vent stack and checking the flashing around it. And I don't see any problems with this one, actually. It's all pretty well. I'm also checking the step flashing. So for three-tab shingles or laminated shingles, I look for step flashing that is stepped with every row and there should be counter flashing where the shingle surface meets something else, a penetration or a wall, a sidewall. There's vents, call them turtle vents, hood vents, flat vents. Um, so those vents are installed to provide ventilation to the attic. Chimney stack penetrates the roof. Anything that penetrates the roof surface 
um, I'm going to inspect. And I'm guessing by the shape of the terracotta flue that this is for a fuel-fired heating system. It's not a fireplace. Fireplaces tend to be rectangular. Oh, by the way, this is um, the climate is Pennsylvania. So it's northeastern climate of the United States, um, cold climate, cold in the wintertime. So if you don't know how to inspect a roof, we have a ton of resources, and they're all online and available to members. And there's the URL. It's a little complicated, but natchi.org slash go slash roof. And there you'll find a ton of resources, all online, about how to inspect a roof. And remember, you're not required to walk upon any roof surface. I don't recommend it. But while I'm there, I am inspecting this masonry chimney stack. It's got some stucco applied to a masonry structure. The wash is okay. You don't have to inspect any flue liner, any interior flue liner. Those are beyond the scope of a home inspection. You do not have to inspect them. But if I have, personally, if I have access, I'm going to snap a shot. And I'm going to put that picture in my inspection report. And that's part of my brand, my service. And the flue looks good. I don't see any major problems with it. The flashing is different, though. So this is black uh, roof sealant applied to the top edge of the step flashing. Step flashing should be covered by counter flashing. All this flashing stuff is in our roof course. Um, so this roof sealant is, um, is not permanent. It's kind of like a Band-Aid. It's temporary. It's going to last for a little bit, maybe a couple seasons, and then crack and then you're going to have some problems with the flashing, right? Ideally, there would be a strip of metal grooved into the masonry, bent, folded, covering the step flashing, so that everything is diverting water and shedding water. So that's not good. So I'm going to call that out as a major defect. This cannot be fixed by the typical homeowner. Right, I'm going to call that out as a major defect, and it needs to be fixed by a roofer. Because as soon as I leave this house, uh, it's going to rain, it's going to leak around that chimney, and last person out is the first person who's called, usually. I take pictures of the gutter and the drip edge. Gutter needs to be cleaned. No big deal. While I'm up there, I'm also taking video. Yeah, I was watching a roof frisbee. There's a ventilation hood providing. So you get the idea. I'm snapping pictures. I do about 50 pictures of the roof, no matter what roof I'm on. And I'll do a handful of video. And then I'll play those videos for my client before I leave at the kitchen counter, at the kitchen table. And that's part of the um, value, the perceived value that I provide to my clients because I don't want them on the roof with me. I don't want them on the roof at all. Homeowners should not be on the roof. In fact, you know, every homeowner should hire a home inspector every year to inspect their roof as part of a homeowner routine maintenance plan. Well, anyways, um, I'll play these videos for my client and they get a, just a kick out of it because I can explain to them the condition of the roof, but it's best for them to see it themselves. And a picture is worth a thousand words, but a video is amazing. So this is me coming down from my ladder, inspecting the second floor window sills, trim where the front porch roof meets the house, look in good shape. Those bay windows, sometimes some of those bay windows are installed improperly where the roof structure or the structure of the bay um, meets the house. And then I think about how water is collected, shed from the roof. No roof is waterproof. Shed from the roof, not shingle roof, sloped roof. No, no sloped roof is waterproof. It's water resistant. So that water is shed, in, caught by the gutters, diverted into the downspouts, and pushed away from the house. So I'm making sure that all the water that's collected from the roof uh, and controlled is diverted away from the foundation. So we've got some 
bends here in the downspouts. That's pretty cool. It's being kicked out. And so I'm on the ground. Hopefully, while I'm on the roof, remember I got there early? At about 8 o'clock, my client pulls up or their agent pulls up, and I'm on the roof, and I wave to them. I want to emphasize that I'm on the roof. And I want, I imagine, for many years, I just imagined my client looking at me, waving to them, going, is that my home inspector? I guess I hired the right person, right? I come down off my ladder, and I shake their hand, and I greet them, and we start the inspection with my client. I'm way ahead now. My home inspection was scheduled for 8 o'clock, but I'm 15, 20, half hour into it, right? And I've got the roof system done because I write my inspection reports, always have, with a mobile device. So uh, if I were inspecting today, I don't do a home inspections now, but I would use a device like this, your iPhone or your Droid or your tablet or your iPad and buy software that allows you to go mobile. Why? Well, there are many advantages that I have over my competition who is writing their inspection reports at night and staying up late, right? Obviously, my competitors do not value their time and they get worn out after a while. Me, I want my time to be saved. I wanna be able to do everything I need to do in my business quickly and save my precious time. And that means I have to go mobile. Uh, I'll just explain why. Uh, I get there early, I do the inspection, and I'm snapping pictures as I do my inspection. And those pictures end up right where I put my comment. So I wanna write a comment about the, um, uh, the flashing around the main vent stack. Remember that? I had my hand on it, cast iron. I say that was in good shape, no major defects there. I take a picture, click, and that picture goes right to my sentence. Go to the next thing, chimney stack, the flashing around the chimney stack, roof sealant, major defect, correction is recommended, a couple of pictures, maybe a video, a wrap around the entire chimney, do a video, boom. Those pictures, that media, those pictures, that video pops right into my chimney narrative or sentences or paragraph about that defect. When I step off the roof and get onto my ladder, my inspection report of that roof system is done. I don't write it later. I don't compile it at night. I don't try to remember what photographs I took and bring them in at eight o'clock at night while I'm writing a report and try to remember what I saw and what did I wanted to say. Nope, I'm done with my roof inspection. I'm done with my report of that section as well. I come down, I meet my client, I'm way ahead now. I know in my head, I'm managing my time wisely. I got there early, my client thinks I'm starting on time, and I'm ready to go. And what do I do next? Oh, and I'm writing my inspection report as I go, which includes video as well. So um, I tell my client, well, you know, I shake hands, I pull out a bunch of business cards, and I tell my client, you know, congratulations for finding your new home, welcome to the neighborhood, because I'm inspecting for my neighbors, essentially. Um, and I know we're going to see each other again. Uh, I invite people over for a summer barbecue, et cetera, et cetera. Um, homeowner newsletter, I send it out every month. Um, and I tell my client what's going to happen. Well, I just did the roof found a couple things wrong. I took a, a bunch of pictures and video of it. It'll be in the report, but I think you need a roofer for the flashing around the chimney. I'll look on the inside, see if I can get into the attic and see if it's actively leaking. We'll look at the seller's disclosure, disclosure but I think that needs to be repaired and I'll show you why in the inspection report. It'll be really clear. No big deal. Maybe I'll give them a, an estimate of repair in dollar value. I invite them to walk around with me on the outside if they don't want to, they probably don't. Go ahead in. I'll be in in about 15 minutes. I'll tell you what I find with the exterior. And if you're around, I'm going to the heating system next. I try to do the big systems first, you know. And that's it. So I, then I go around and I inspect the, the exterior. Now, what am I inspecting? What am I inspecting on the roof? What does a home inspector check? Well, what you're required to check 
on the roof in the exterior and any other system in the home is written in the standards of practice. So I look at the standards of practice, right? And I develop a template. It's a checklist in my software that is built upon those standards. I, if I'm required to inspect something like um, the roof covering, then it's going to be in my checklist in my software so that I don't mess up. It helps reduce my mistakes, helps reduce my liability because it's in here. I can't go to the exterior from the roof without checking everything that I'm required to inspect according to the standards of practice. And it's written in my report when I go from one system to the next, that older, so that prior system has been inspected according to the standards of practice and the report is written. Done, right? It's a really good way. To write an inspection report, it's a great way to not make mistakes during your inspection because you essentially have a checklist of what you're supposed to inspect and what you're not required to inspect. And you can customize it too. I mean, I inspect, I go far above the standards of practice. I inspect things that are not required to be inspected by the standards of practice because the standards of practice is a minimum. It's an absolute minimum. This is absolutely what the minimum you're supposed to do, right? So you can go beyond that. You're permitted to go beyond, and I do. Um, so th that's what I wanted to um, focus a little bit on, using the standards of practice as a starting point, a foundation upon which to build your inspection process. What do I actually do with my eyes and my feet and my hands? What do I actually inspect, right? It will guide you with that. And what you do in the inspection should be also guided by, directed by, your checklist, which is essentially your software that you carry in your hand. So you don't have to remember everything and it won't allow you to skip anything, right? Helps you reduce mistakes, be concise and efficient with your time. If you're efficient with your time, then you're making good money because you want to make this amount of money and divide it by your time in order to get a really high dollar value per hour, right? You want to make a lot of money in a short amount of time, right? Um, yeah, so that's what I want to emphasize. Okay, so I'm at the standard. I'm at the exterior. I'm down one system. I have introduced myself, saw my client. They've gone in, and now I'm alone on the exterior. If they come with me, I'm going to go around the exterior left uh, counterclockwise. I tend to go counterclockwise for every property, even if it's an end unit like this. Um, I go left or right or counterclockwise around for every property exterior, every roof, every room in the basement, bedrooms, every around counterclockwise. I just same pattern. And if you do the same pattern, you're using the same checklist over and over again, then you'll find that after like five years of doing home inspections, um, defects tend to just jump out at you. <laughs> There'll be a stumbling block. Sometimes literally you'll fall, you'll trip over them because you're using the same pattern, the same standard, the same checklist, the same process, the same direction. And then when a defect happens to be in your way, uh, you'll just find that it just tends to pop out. That's why you want to be consistent in everything that you do, right? You want to be efficient as well. So using a a checklist essentially while you inspect and collect data um, helps you follow a standards of practice and that process will also help you make fewer mistakes but also um, defects will jump out at you. So that's how you find defects. You have a system in place, right? You put systems in your in place for your business as well as your, your home inspection practice. Um, on this house, it's a townhouse end unit. I'm on the exterior. I may take them around um, but then I'll, I'll shove them back into the house. My clients go, you know, measure something, go check out your kitchen or your bedrooms and start planning your renovation projects, home improvement projects. Um, and then I do uh, a loop around the exterior myself and I'm really inspecting for Sirius and I'm entering data in my software. So I'm looking for grading. I want grading sloped away from the, the house so that water sheds away from the foundation. There's my truck with my big ladders. 
It's always in the report. I inspect every parking area, every stoop, step, sidewalk, stairs, deck. This grading is too close to the basement. Uh, I think it's a basement. It could be crawl space. Um, basement window. Uh, imagine two feet of snow. Remember, it's Pennsylvania. We, it snows there. Two feet of snow melting. That snow melt might just go right into the the basement window. So a, a, um, a window well could be um, installed. Um, some utilities are there. You have to identify the meter. I like to identify which meter is my meter. So, and I pull on the meter to make sure it's attached to the house securely. Sometimes they actually fall off. Um, and the meter itself is not attached very well. Um, it's not loose, but there's a, a potential for um, water penetration behind the meter. And behind the meter, it's usually the, the installer will, um, um, the electrician might get there before. So the meter might be on before the siding. Or, you know, maybe the siding material is there and they cut it out anyways. Um, but usually that meter is attached to the um, plywood sheathing or particle board sheathing directly. So if it's not flashed properly um, and there's nothing behind it, no water proofing or shedding materials behind it, like uh, a felt paper or something, uh, or Tyvek, um, we're going to have water moisture intrusion issues. And they've been gooping silicone for years around this thing. So this could be a, a defect that could be fixed. Looking at the silicone around the gas line going into the house, uh, there's the rod. Unfortunately, the rod is sticking out of the ground. It should be slammed in. Um, and there's the grounding wire on the acorn nut, which is installed right. There's the natural gas supplied to the house. That's the meter. Not too concerned about the surface rust. Gas is on. Utilities, cable, phone. And now I'm doing the ex exterior siding. And I'm going around the house and looking for anything that's bad on the exterior siding. Loose, damaged, buckling, uh, fastening problems, flashing problems. Um, Janine, why isn't missing flashing considered a material defect? Well, it's not going to hurt someone. And it's not going to adversely impact significantly the value of the home. Like, um, like incredible amount of mold throughout the house, right? Um, or it's not going to be a deck or um, something structural that's going to um, collapse and fall in. Or um, maybe uh, um, a loose guardrail where somebody, if they're going to rely on that guardrail, will fall and hurt themselves, right? Or something exposed at the main electrical panel, like a live bus bar, where if you touch it, you're not just shocked, you're electrocuted to death, right? Something fatal. So um, missing flashing, I would consider it a major defect. And really, it's going to be up to you. You're the one who's going to make that call. It's totally subjective. Not totally subjective, but Essentially, it's your opinion. Um, John asks, what are some of the mobile software companies? I like Spectora, S-P-E-C-T-O-R-A.com, Spectora.com. A, a relatively new company, newer company, and um, they're great. They do presentations here in Boulder, Colorado at International Headquarters in the House of Horrors. Um, they know everything about SEO. They do websites for home inspectors, and they have an amazing software that works. I actually have it on my phone. Um, Spector is on my phone. Um, home Inspector Pro I like as well um, because I use iPhones. And so those softwares uh, work on iPhone devices, but I think also they work on any device, actually. So... Um, but for me, it has to work on something mobile. Um, Alexander, I had homeowners ask to climb the roof with me during inspection. Heck no. Um, I actually put this on my ladder rung. It says, stay back. <laughs> I'm at work here. So it's narrow enough to go on a ladder, and it hangs there and it prevents anyone from climbing the ladder, reminds them 
to just stay away, right? I put that in front of the crawl space or any access um, area. I don't want the homeowner on the roof at all. And I don't care if it's if the roof access is eight feet from the ground and it's flat, a flat roof. No one's going up on a roof with me. Um, let's see. What report software? What report software? You plug in information, heat pump determiner. Yeah, so data plates. We'll get to the data plates. Okay, so um, so I'm going around the exterior, and there's um, an outdoor condenser with a compressor unit. And I call it the compressor unit or condenser unit or outdoor coil, a lot of things you can refer to it. Um, is it an air conditioning or a heat pump? Well, the manufacturing plate can tell you if it's an air conditioning or a heat pump, or I'll shut up, right? <laughs> until I get inside and look at the heating system or the furnace or the air conditioner system and confirm it on there. I, I have made that mistake before, so I'm not gonna do it again. I like to see if it's a split system like this with a compressor unit on the outside and evaporator coil on the inside, I'm gonna take a look at the split system as a whole before I determine what the heck is going on, right? So this is actually a heat pump, right? And there's the... Um, manufacturing plate label and I take a picture of it I take a picture of every one right um, in your area you may be required to transfer some of this data into your software or your inspection report um, in Pennsylvania um, the reports were not uh, regulated very much but I like to collect data while I'm there digital pictures are free I can snap it in a minute uh, a second really <laughs> And so I'm gonna grab this data. There's another reason too. It has the um, model number and serial number of the unit. And if I wanted to go beyond the standards of practice and figure out when this unit was actually manufactured, um, you can grab this data from the plate and then go, I don't know this company at all, but a lot of people use it. It's an amazing company. I hope they stick around for a long time. If you go to buildingcenter.org, I think it's run by a home inspector. Show what it looks like. Uh, you can um, click the button for water heaters or HVAC equipment. So let's go to HVAC. And you can enter your um, name like, oh, uh, let's see. Let's, uh, what would that be? Oh, I don't know. I'm just gonna pick a uh, Lennox. And depending upon the, um, the way, the style that the serial number is written out, um, that information you can interpret using this database when that unit was manufactured, down to the month or week, actually, for some units. So it's a kind of cool thing if you wanted to do that. Um, move that over. So buildingcenter.org. Uh, I recommend the website while it's around. Um, I don't know them at all, but they seem to have a really great website and they're doing it absolutely for free. So I really highly uh, thank them. Uh, it's really commendable to provide that kind of data for inspectors so that we can um, provide more information. Um, if you're really into figuring out how old a particular unit is, I never was. I kind of just guessed. I told my clients, I'm just guessing. I could be way off. Um, but after a while, after a few years of doing inspections, you can probably figure out the, the age of systems and components simply by looking at them and looking for other clues. Refrigerant line is under the mulch, not so good. Um, no flashing, highly sealed, kind of like a monitoring, monitoring, you have to monitor that. There's the disconnect, it's gotta be within sight. I know I'm at the right property. Um, significant rust and corrosion at the bottom. Um, and even the wire clamp connection is loose because of it. I'm going to call that a major defect because a homeowner can't replace that. You need an HVAC unit, uh, technician, um, HVAC system technician, or um, electrician. There's the vent pipe for the main clean out the house trap in the front yard. Uh, there's a hood for a vent, right? An exhaust. Is it kitchen? Is it bathroom? Is it laundry? If you see lint, yeah, 
could be laundry. You want to don't want any screens on a dryer vent exhaust. Uh, you want all your bathrooms and kitchens and dryer uh, exhausting outside, and you want a, an automatic damper on there, and you want to secure it to the house. Looks okay. A lot of silicone. They love silicone on this house. Weep holes at the brick. That's nice to see. And the siding looks pretty good. Everything looks pretty good on, on the outside. There was a flagpole there. A little stand was removed, and they put silicone. Um, there's a, a bit of a settlement at the front steps uh, between the kind of like the sidewalk portion and the steps. Um, so I'm going to mention that in the report. They try to fix it, but you can see it just keeps settling. Uh, you don't want one step very different from another. So one riser height can't be very different from another one. Um, I'm not a code inspector. Thank goodness, right? But I'm a home inspector. So I talk about risers and treads and steps and stoops in general terms. If I feel like this could be a trip hazard, I'm going to call it out. All receptacles should be GFCI protected. Ah, and this is a door. This is the front door. And when I come to anything that penetrates the building envelope, the siding, let's say, the wall, um, I tend to look at the bottom corners and the top corners. Bottom left, bottom right, top right, top left, something like that. Hopefully it's counterclockwise. And look for flashing or openings for water intrusion. That is a defect. Typically uh, a major defect, you need an electrician. Don't want anybody getting hurt. Homeowner could do it, but um, it takes some skill to do that. So that's damaged receptacle on the outside. And now I'm on the inside. So I'm done with the exterior. I've written what? I've inspected the roof and I've written the report for the roof. I've inspected the exterior and I've written the report for the exterior. Now I try to do what is most important to my clients, which usually if I'm with um, dad or a contractor or some family members, they want to see the big stuff first. Give me the heating system. I'll do the heating system and then I'll do like water, hot water source, um, maybe the electrical panel next and then the structure. And then after that, um, it's to the attic. So I'm going to do the HVAC system. I know I've got that condenser compressor coil on the outside, right? And on the inside, it's an air conditioner. Ah, it's an air conditioner. It's not a heat pump. So there's my refrigerant line, large insulated lines, suction line, thinner copper line uh, is the liquid line. Uh, condensate from the evaporator, the air conditioner evaporator coil um, produces condensate and that condensate needs to drain out. Um, ah, it's in a sump pump, which is plugged in. So when I look at a system, I take a picture away from the system and then I move in halfway and I get a little bit closer and then I move in real close and get components and I follow the path of components. I take a picture of every component, every time, in every system, in every house, in the same way. So there's that was the air conditioner coil. Done. That's it. done in my inspection report. Now I'm at the heating system. What efficiency is this heating system? Is it low efficiency, medium efficiency, or high efficiency? You're not required to um, identify or determine and identify that, right? But you could if you wanted to so that um, you can sound more intelligent, right? Your inspection report is written up a little bit better than your competition and you provide extra value, right? And also, oh, we'll talk about efficiencies, high efficiency heating systems installed in older homes. So it's not a low efficiency. Just strike that out. They stopped making them for a while. So, um, so having a low efficiency natural draft furnace um, is going to be really difficult in the next uh, decade to find. You know, they'll be very old. So it's not low efficiency because I see the flue pipe up here. 
Let's see. Can I do that? Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh. Let's see. If I do that. Yeah. Well, anyways, it's up here. The connection isn't a natural draft. There isn't a hood. So I know it's not low. And I know it's not high because same place. The flue pipe is metal and it's not plastic. Um, for high efficiency, um, it's burning so much of the fuel, it's wasting very little and very little heat escapes the heat exchanger. And so the connection pipe, the flue pipe from the heat exchanger can be plastic, right? Low temperature. And it produces condensate from the, from the heat exchanger in the flue. So that's not happening either. So it's mid-efficiency, actually. Mid-efficiency, natural, um, natural draft would have no inducer fan, no fan on the draft. This one does. So it draws combustion air through the heat exchanger and pushes it, essentially, out the flue. High efficiency heating system would not have exposed or open chamber. There's the, the burner chamber, right? Essentially, the, the natural gas comes in through the pilot. It's electrically ignited. Natural gas would have a flame, a pilot flame. And if this one has a ticker. It goes and it ignites the gas as it torches into the heat exchanger. And it has that nice rumble and blue flame. Right? So I'm taking pictures of everything, every component. Here's a service switch or a shutoff switch for the heating system. So I'm in the dining room upstairs as I come in from the exterior in my indoor only shoes, find the thermostat, I turn on the heating system, I run down to the basement and I look at the heating system and I listen for the cycle and I'm listening for it to go through its cycle. The draft inducer fan turns on, induces a draft. The blower may turn on. The, um, I'll hear the ignition turn on. The flames turn on. And then I wanna hear the, um, sorry, not the blower. Then I wanna hear the, the blower turn on after the heat exchanger warms up, right? All these things turn on for me, and I turn off the heating system, done. I get to open up the, the unit without, I, I get to open up the air filter without the air filter being sucked into the blower. That's a washable filter. I get to touch the flue pipe to make sure it's secured with screws, three screws every joint, where it goes into the chimney stack. And I'm not gonna get hurt because the system is off. I put everything back in, put the cover back on, turn the heating system on again. It goes through its cycle one more time. I don't need to heat up the entire house in the winter or summertime. Just need it to go through a cycle. I just wanna see it turn on. If I wanna turn on the air conditioner, I let the blower run for 15, 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, and then I'll turn on the air conditioner. And I don't need to cool the entire house. Just want to hear it cycle through. When you turn on the air conditioner, you'll hear it sounds and clicks and things like that. And then the circulating fan will turn on. And if you're in certain areas of the country in the United States, like Texas, you're required to uh, take the temperature of in and out, the delta T, right, to make sure that it's actually heating or cooling with a, a difference in temperature measurements. But in Pennsylvania, that's not required. So you have to follow your local authority, uh, local codes, standards, especially if your state regulates home inspectors. Now I'm on the hot water tank, a little homemade water moisture meter uh, is there. So that's kind of neat. Um, it's a natural draft. There's a flame there underneath the blanket around the hot water tank. I don't like blankets around the hot water tank. They tend to get in the way. I don't adjust the dial for the heating system. I don't turn anything on. I don't turn on any gas valves or water valves. I don't turn it on and off any of that stuff. Um, if the pile light is out, it's out. And I put it in the report as an inspection restriction. There's the gas shut off. There's a Bradford White hot water tank. Cold water line coming in through a shutoff valve. Natural draft. And there's my inspection restrictions. With all this extra wiring going on, homemade gadgets. 
on extension cords. So I'll just, it'll probably be removed when the house is sold. So I'm not too concerned about all the extra wiring. I'm just looking at the questions. Do you provide a hard copy to your clients or is it mostly digital? So I'll ask if I'm ahead of schedule and I, and I ask my client if they would like to stay for another 15 minutes, I'll actually bring my printer in and print out the inspection report. And I printed it, I used to print it in color, and then I got smart and printed it in black and white. And um, I'll print an inspection report like this. Can you see that? Oh, here. So I'll print it and I'll use paper that has three holes because I'm going to put it in a binder like this. All right? And inside this binder, behind the inspection report, is a home maintenance book. This is Internachi's home maintenance book, $2.70. Full color, fully customizable. So you can customize it. We'll design, do all that design work for free if you purchase the books. And there's other pockets in the, my binder. It's a really nice thing. It gives weight to something that's typically digital. The copy of the inspection report will also be in the cloud. And that's where the videos are. Because you can't print videos, right? So I can print a, a hard copy and have um, electronic copy with pictures and videos um, from the cloud. And you may say, oh, $2.70, that's too expensive for a home maintenance book. Well, I give one to every client. It's really great. Provides value. Something that my competitors may not be doing. And I don't pay $2.70. It's really free because all I do is I increase my service fee, $5. And I allow my own clients to purchase their own home maintenance books and my coffee for the day, right? So never, if the value is, if the, the value costs more than the value itself, right? Then don't do it. If the perceived value of this far exceeds the cost, then it's a great business decision. So the cost of this is just several dollars. Um, the binder is a dollar or something. The home maintenance book is $2.70 couple pennies for the ink and the paper. So increase your fee and you don't actually pay for it. Your client pays for their own binded report, right? If the perceived value, the value of this for my client far exceeds the cost, then it's a great idea. It's a great business idea. And the cost isn't even mine because I increased my inspection fee by five bucks to cover that overhead. Um, more questions about software, more questions. Is it considered a major defect if a home has a low efficiency HVAC system? Um, no, not in my opinion. It's not going to hurt anybody. It doesn't reduce the value of the home. Do you label every picture? Do you say something about the condition under the picture? No, no, no time. There's no time for that. In Spectora software, um, in Home Inspector Pro, um, you can strike and um, draw an arrow if you wanted to. That's about all I'll do. And if I have a customized sentence, something that it wasn't written already by me, because it's common, right? I'll, I'll just have everything that I want to write. It's, I say the same thing almost every inspection report, so I'm just clicking what I want to say. If there's something unique that I find in the, um, I would write, um, I'd use my microphone, I don't type. My, my thumbs, I'm not very good with my thumbs typing. So I would just use the, the microphone feature and speak my sentence about the homeowner has a lot of extra wiring sitting around the house and the hot water tank and in the basement near the furnace, period. There are a lot of extension cords, period. This is not part of the inspection, period. That's it. And that's in the report. Take a picture. That's in the report. I don't type anything. Don't type. I'm really fast, right? 
so mobile software is amazing. The hot water tank is not leaking. There's plenty of access, so all in good shape. Next, I think of water going out. So that's hot water, uh, roof, exterior, HVAC, hot water source. Now, sewer going out and water coming in. There's the main line going out. We saw the, the vent pipe and uh, clean out and trap, house trap on the outside. Copper and cast iron. There it is. Connection looks pretty good. Looks like it's supported well. There's the dryer vent. So I'm inspecting one system and, oh, I come across another system. No big deal. My software allows me to jump from place to place, right? And I go back to where I was. So oh, dryer vent pipe. I don't like the length of this temporary um, plastic uh, dryer vent. I want to see metal, right? So I'm going to put that in report. There's the gas supply and gas shutoff valve for the dryer. There's the hot water, cold water on braided mesh pressure tested hoses. Those are good. Receptacles and laundries are required to be GFCI. There's the stand pipe for the clothes washer. It has duct tape on it. You may want to ask why is there duct tape there? Uh, maybe there's some splash. Maybe there's some problems with the drainage. Maybe it doesn't go down very well. Maybe it's the wrong height. Remember, I'm not a code inspector. Maybe it fell out once. Had that happen before. Uh, that's the main water shut um, uh, main water shutoff valve. Figured that one out. A lot of valves all over the place. And now I'm to the electrical. So that's water going out, water coming in. Now I'm in electrical. Next one is structure. Oh, by this time. Uh, remember I got there early, 7.30, I did the roof, shook the hands, wrote the, report, wrote the report for the roof. Now I did the exterior, 15 minutes, wrote the report. I go to the heating system, another 15 minutes at the heating system, top. Hot water source, five minutes. Water going out, water coming in. We'll have to find the pipes and maybe follow them a little bit, so that takes another 15 minutes. Now I'm at electrical. Oh, I did dryer. I did the laundry there and the, got in the way. So another five minutes there. So I'm doing pretty well. In my head, I'm thinking I need electrical and structure, and then I'm to the attic. That's where I want to go. I want to get through these big systems within about an hour or so so I can get to the attic before my two-hour mark. So electrical panel, 100-amp electrical panel. Breakers not all specifically identified. You do not have to take off the dead front cover. I do not recommend it. It's hazardous. It could be fatal. So don't do it. Although my brand, I exceeded the standards of practice for every client. I took the dead front cover off if I could. Uh, the dead front needs to be secured with proper screws. Take a look at the connections, the wiring. I'm really looking for something. Uh, Overfusing was a common problem that I found in electrical panels where you had a big fat breaker on a thin gauge wire. Breakers look okay. Grounds and neutrals. They're all combined in the same nut. Mm. Couple minutes, I'm done. I'm on to the next thing, right? There's a lot of electronics down in the basement. I think the homeowner was really into electronics. That's kind of cool. But why would I take a picture of that? It's to show that there were a lot of inspection restrictions during my home inspection. I couldn't see everything. It's a ton of stuff all over the place. Try to look behind things. There was an um, electric baseboard heater. I didn't even see it. So I turned it on, made sure it worked. There were water stains in the corner with a little bit of mold and gunk and black stuff there. There's a laundry. Watermarks and patches and paint on the ceiling. I would recommend, highly recommend, another tool. It's not required, but it may help you do a better job. A moisture meter. So this is an X-Tech moisture meter, one of the better ones that I like. Um, it has the dual kind of thing where there's um, a surface sensor and also the probes, right? 
and it's um, audible gauge and it you know, beeps and it gives you a, like a, a readout. I really don't care what the quantitative number is. I'm not measuring anything as a home inspector. I just want to know if it's, if it's wet, if it's damp. Ideally, damp to the touch. This is a great tool. Everyone should have one to see if something's wet. But if you use a moisture meter and it's dry, I'd still put this in the report as a question for the seller to explain. What happened upstairs? Did the first floor half bath have a water leak of some type and it leaked and damaged the ceiling of the basement? There's the thermostat for the baseboard, smoke detector in the wrong location. Um, you're not required to move drop ceiling tiles, but I tend to do that. That's a, beyond the standards of practice. And I also use this tool. This is a gardening tool. Uh, it's a three tine hoe. Uh, I adjust one of the tines to be more straight than the others, and it's extendable so that I can reach up and uh, test smoke detectors, but push ceiling tiles so that I can see floor structures like that, and also um, extend it out and move insulation and put insulation back, especially at their band and rim joist. And I carry that in a tool bag that I bring from my truck to the front door. And it looks something like this. Uh, this is a nice tool bag. It has the Internet G logo on it. So you can get this from Inspector Outlet. And this is a perfect tool bag. Same tool bag that I used. And it has lots of pockets for all of your tools and meters and things like that. Indoor only shoes. And to hook your, your gardening tool, your three tine hoe. Um, I want to take a look at the structure to look for any structural defects. Now I'm on structure, right? HVAC, hot water source, water out, water in, laundry got in the way, um, electrical panel, now structure. And if poured concrete foundation looks pretty good, from what I can see, there's no handrail at the stairs. So if my 86-year-old grandmother was going up and down these stairs, she'd have a heck of a time, right? So it's a safety hazard, which a major defect, I'm going to put it in the report. Now I'm in the attic. Okay, I'm probably at, if the home inspection started at eight o'clock, I'm in about eight, oh, I'm sorry, nine, 9.30. If I'm at 10 o'clock, then I have to think ahead. I have to be very careful. So I gotta wrap this up, right? So you have to manage your time. You're not trying to speed through anything. You're just managing your time. You have to be cognizant, aware of the job that's in front of you within a certain time frame. You don't have all day. Nobody wants to walk around with you for eight hours, right? So you have about a three hour chunk. And when I get to this attic, I know after this attic, I'm basically done. And I'll show you why, because the interior is easy. It's bathrooms, kitchens, windows, doors, floors, things like that. Uh, if there's a garage, there's no garage in this townhouse. So I'm in the attic, I'm kind of excited because I'm ahead of schedule, but I don't just go in to the ceiling, because there's a ceiling access in the closet. I put down my picnic blanket. So I move a couple things off the shelf, don't really want to move personal items. And I get my picnic blanket out, and I put it on top of the clothing, and I get my ladder, and I put it up there, and I go in. I want to protect people's stuff, and I'll take a picture of it too. So nobody complained that their clothes now are all itchy because of insulation that I dropped. Nope. And there's another picture. There's my ladder and my picnic blanket. And from above, there's the attic access, which is not insulated and not sealed. So it's essentially having a hole in the ceiling of that bedroom. That bedroom is probably a different climate than all the other rooms upstairs. In the wintertime, I bet they complain that that room is cold. In the summertime, I bet they complain that that room is hot, right? And it's because of that. This is a hole through which conditioned air escapes. Every building has this natural draft, has a draft effect where air just goes up. So what you want to do 
is seal up those holes and insulate, air seal and insulate. So if you're a home inspector and you find a lack of insulation, you shouldn't just say add more insulation, you just say you, could, you should recommend air sealing and insulation. So at this attic access, great opportunity to help folks save energy and therefore save money by sealing and insulating that attic access. Structure, trusses, I'm looking for anything modified in the field. Cut truss components that should not be cut. Looks pretty good. I don't see any watermarks. There's missing insulation there. So it looks like somebody installed a cable, TV cable, moved the insulation, and didn't have the courtesy to put the insulation back. Would have taken seconds to do so. So there's missing insulation in many areas of the second floor bedrooms. A huge lack of insulation there. Total disregard for energy, right? They're probably freezing up there. So that should be air sealed and insulated. And there's a firewall between the units, a concrete block, CMUs, concrete masonry units. There's no floor, so I can't really walk around safely. So I'm gonna put that as an inspection restriction. I really can't see everything in the attic, but from what I see, here are the things that I found. The structure looks pretty good. I tend to take pictures of um, the fasteners that come through the deck structure, the sheathing. Um, when you get experienced in home inspections, you can tell a lot by the fastener tips. They should be coming through, so you take a picture of them. You can tell how many layers there are, how many, how many fasteners there are on the roof. Um, you tell a lot about the fasteners coming through. You can, if they're rusted and, and uh, have little uh, rust on the tips or white deposits on the tips, um, there might be a ventilation moisture problem in the attic. So it's kind of neat to inspect the fasteners coming through. You can actually see the type of fasteners being used. Okay, now I'm in the second floor. Every bedroom, every floor, every hallway should have a smoke detector, carbon monoxide detector. I test them, uh, make sure that they work. Um, anything that's yellow, any detector that's yellow is old. So uh, I tend to make sure that there's a battery backup as well um, for the hardwired detectors. And now I'm in the bathrooms. So I'm doing really well. And basically in my head, I'm done. I've done the huge systems, got them out of my way. Roof, exterior, HVAC, hot water source, the laundry, right, was done in the basement. Sewer going out, water coming in, electrical, structure, attic. Now I'm doing the interior. For this townhouse, second floor, I've got some bedrooms, maybe a bathroom or two, going downstairs, half bath, probably, some rooms, dining room, living room, kitchen, and I'm done. So I'm thinking about wrapping this up, right? I'm just managing my time. I'm not rushing through. I'm just managing my time, right? Pretty excited. I'm, I've done a great job. I found a lot of major problems. Got it in the report already. Can't wait to get to the kitchen because that's where I end up. It's not an S-trap. It's a P-trap. GFCI, uh, GFCIs or uh, every receptacle in a bathroom needs to be protected by GFCI. Um, the tiles, I tend to push and pound on the tiles. On the shower walls, you know, and the grout lines, I wanna make sure that there's nothing loose or leaking. If my hand goes through, well, that's what I'm there for. So I take a picture of it. I don't try to hide it. If something breaks in my hand, it shouldn't have. So I take a picture of it. And every access panel, I like the plumbing access panels to be accessible and I open them and I take a picture of them looking for water leaks or bad installs. And there's the um, water line for the refrigerator, ice maker. It's kind of neat. Uh, second floor doors, windows, representative number of wall receptacles and lights and doors just going through, opening and closing some windows and doors, making sure they're open and closed, nothing cracked, nothing damaged. I like to take the floor register off for a furnace, a forced air furnace. I like to take the floor register off the 
you know, the grill and stick my hand in there or at least stick my camera in there. And usually the ducts are not clean. It's an indoor air quality issue. If you want to comment upon it, um, this house had ducts filled with the original sawdust when it was built 20, 30 years ago. Cosmetic stains. Now I'm on the first floor, wall receptacles, using my GFCI tester. So if you're new, uh, it's a pretty low investment to get into a home inspection business. You need, hmm, where's my GFCI tester? You need a flashlight, right? High lumens and a GFCI tester. I'll be darned. Well, that's my GFCI tester. Well, it's a little guy. Uh, looks like that. And it tells you if the receptacle um, is wired properly. Although, it's possible that there's incorrect wiring at the receptacle that's giving you a false positive. So be careful with that. I just like to look at it. I don't comment that all the wiring in the house is wired properly. I just look for obvious defects that I can find that are indicated by some devices that I have. Just like my infrared camera. If my infrared camera allows me to see things, I'll try to interpret it and make a comment upon it. That device there allows me to see, observe things that may indicate a problem. And if there's a problem indicated, I'll definitely put it in the report. Doors, windows, first floor, first floor, ceiling, first floor, first floor, looking good. Half bath, trap, sink. So there's a defect there. I'll tag that as a major defect. You need a contractor to help you out. The metal sink is just rusted away. GFCI's work. And now the ceiling. I like to take pictures of the ceiling. That's why in the basement I took a picture of the ceiling because it had watermarks. I like to take a picture of the ceiling on the first floor below the second floor bathroom, right? Bathrooms. And when I'm on the second floor, I like to picture, take a picture of the ceilings so that I can see if anyone um, has had any roof problems or leaks in the past, right? So taking pictures of ceilings is kind of handy. Kitchen sink, GFCI protection. Um, a cross finger like that means there's something wrong. So there's no GFCI protection or the GFCI isn't functioning or there's dead receptacles there. Um, so it's a, just a helpful thing for me. Garbage disposal. Dishwasher, I run a short cycle at the dishwasher. If it leaks, it shouldn't have leaked. Um, and I take a picture of it. Cosmetic flaws at the counter. Turn on the burners, snap a picture, turn on the oven. I'm not baking everything. I just want to see the oven flames turn on, go through a cycle. Um, the hood is recyclable. It doesn't, doesn't exhaust outside. It really should. And there's stains and um, some damage on the old vinyl flooring in the kitchen. And basically, I'm done. So I then bring in my printer if they think they want a printed report, like in a binder. Um, otherwise, I click a button. It's sent to the cloud. It's downloadable and emailed to my clients and their agents. And I get to manage them um, online. I can see if they sign their agreement, sign their inspection report, paid me, all that good stuff can be now managed electronically through some management systems. And um, that's it. I have some time for lunch and I get to my next job at 12 o'clock. I do the same thing over again. I used to do three a day. It's a long day. But two a day is pretty good. And how do you price your fees? Well, it has nothing to do with guesswork. It has very little to do with your competition. It has everything to do with math. If there's a simple calculated formula that you use for figuring out what to charge. And um, it's in our home inspection business course. It's a free online course. It's called the home inspection business course. And I highly recommend it. Chapter 11 is where you want to go. It's about how to price your inspection fees so that they are profitable. Um, 
If you want to take a look at inspection report samples written by other inspectors, here's an unfortunate URL. <laughs> it's really long. It's natchiorg slash home hyphen inspection hyphen report hyphen samples, but it's actually worth your time if you wanted to go there. And um, these slides will also be available on Natchi TV when we upload the video recording of the class. A few URLs you may have missed in the beginning of a class. Natchi TV, that's where free online classes, live classes just like this, are taking place. You can register for the next one. Um, I think it's December 21st, something like that. Um, third week in December. Uh, Natchi.org forward slash everything is a really great site where we try to put everything that you need to be successful in 15 steps. Natchi.org SOP is where our standards of practice is. And if you need anything from me, um, just email me, Ben at Internachi. And are there any questions? Um, John asks, as a real estate investor, excuse me, how can I find the best inspector in a given area? Uh, easy. New slide. Uh, insert text box. So you want to go to inspectorseek.com. And you type in a zip code and you find the best inspectors in the world. There's also certified, certified master inspector.org. <gasps> Org, there. And there's a search field there. And you type in a zip code and find certified master inspectors, certified master inspector.org or inspectorseek.com. Um, Greg, do you write up the extra cords recommend removal. Um, I may write them up, and you know if there's something odd, I'll put it in the inspection report. I certainly will have a picture of it because I want to document just about everything. So if I do get served and uh, I'm taking a court small claims and I'm standing in front of a judge, um, I'll have all the data that I need to defend myself. So I have taken a don't. Be scared about being sued. Anybody can sue anyone in the United States. So what you want to do is make sure you have all your legal documentation um, in order. And so go to InterNACHI's legal department uh, for advice. Um, find a local uh, attorney or a business consultant, a local one, because that local attorney will probably know um, other businesses, other home inspection businesses, and other uh, judges um, and practices, best practices. Um, and uh, start from there. We have a library of documents. It's kind of like a legal Zoom for home inspectors, and uh, InterNACHI has those resources for you. So I would also start with InterNACHI, because those legal things are online and available to InterNACHI members for free. So you start there, and then you move on. Um, let's see. Is it a good idea to have on your website recognized by the BBB? I never did. It's up to you. It's part of marketing. Um, um, I always recommended video testimonials from your clients. So after the home inspection, you ask somebody to stand in front of your, to ask for a, a little testimonial. Can, I, can you say something nice about your inspection today? Yeah, sure. Okay. Can I Facebook it? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, la, la, la. Hey, uh, you know, just finished up a home inspection with Big Ben Inspections. It was really great. I highly recommend it. Thanks. There. Video testimonials. Most powerful um, marketing piece that you could have, right? Uh, someone else recommending in a live video where you can see them speaking, recommending another person, right? That's really good. Don't put text testimonials on your website. I highly recommend just asking your clients. You only need is three or five on your website for testimonials, you know, video testimonials. It's so easy. It doesn't have to be professionally edited or anything. Um, actually, the more informal and rough it is, the better, because it looks genuine. What other types, what other items are in your binder? Oh, man. I used to put um, candy. Uh, peach candy. It's part of my brand. So 
the company was Peach Inspection. So we um, hosted uh, real estate office meetings with peach pastries. Um, we used to deliver baskets of fresh peaches. Uh, we used to hand out um, peach candy, peach buds, they were called. Um, but inside here, there's um, a pocket for um, other things that you do. They're called ancillary services. So if I did a home inspection, um, my base price was 396, 396. I was disappointed because I wanted to make at least five or six hundred dollars for every inspection, gross. So um, I wanted to I wanted to increase my gross revenue in certain ways. One of them was to offer ancillary services at just the right time. So when they are scheduling a home inspection, if my office manager could invite them to uh, uh, consider other services like a mold inspection, a radon test, a water quality test, something like that, an infrared scan, um, I would do that. Um, because you should look up for your homework, if I can give you homework, for the until the next class, look up the word commodity, commodity. Because that's, that's something that, uh, that describes, um, it means the same thing. So if you look at one inspector and another, they're basically doing the same thing. We're basically doing the same thing, right? And you don't want to be in that world where one inspector could be interchanged with another. That's what a commodity is, right? You want to be in a different kind of world where um, ever go into a store and um, you're looking at the watches and there's a hundred watches some of them are $10 and some of them are $1,000, right? They all do the same thing, tell you the time. And they all actually, actually, they all cost the same to make. To make a $10 watch costs the manufacturer just about the same as it does to make a $1,000 watch. There's some difference, but it's basically a commodity. Watches are a commodity, but the perceived value is where you want to be, right? When the perceived value of that watch, which is a thousand dollars, if that's what you are selling, that's where you want to be. You don't want to be selling a ten dollar watch. So if you're a home inspector and we're gathering the same data, you don't want to be a commodity like with every other inspector. You want to have that perceived value that's so great that they'll spend more money on you than the other person. You're basically doing the same thing, following the same standards of practice, collecting the same information writing out the same reports, but what makes you different from all the rest? So you don't want to be a commodity. Look up the word commodity. You want to do something different. And one of the things you could do that's different is to, at the right time, sell the right service, right? Not everybody wants a mold inspection, but when somebody is thinking about it and you offer it, it could just, you could time it just right, right? So the best time to maybe offer a mold inspection is when you find moisture intrusion in the basement. And if you don't know how to sell a service while you're performing an inspection, you can use one of these things that are in your binder pocket, right? And it says, while I'm here, you may want me to inspect your home for mold. Why? Well, mold damages what it grows on. So you don't even have to know the elevator pitch. If you can't remember it, or if you get nervous, just look at one of these things. These rack cards can be ordered from InterNACHI through our inspector outlet store partner. And you can have these rack cards in your pocket here, right? Did you know radon, um, you can't see it, smell it, or taste radon, but it may be a problem in your home. And though and then the only way to really find out if it's a problem is to test it. And while I'm here, let me test your home for radon. Right? So here, read this while I finish up the HVAC system inspection. Right? So in here are maybe some pieces where um, I can provide additional services. Maybe not during my inspection, but maybe afterwards, because I'm in the neighborhood. Learn how your home compares with other neighbors in the home. Is it more efficient or less efficient? How do you do that? Well, 
you can get your home scored. It's similar to a, a gallons per mile rating for a car. It's a scale of one to 10. 10 is really energy efficient. One is you've got a lot of energy efficient energy efficiency, deficiencies, right? So um, that's what's in the, the pockets of my binder. Um, let's see, for a beginning inspector has not got their routine fast enough to input data during the actual inspection. Do you have any ideas as knowing and remembering what room or area or of the house you are completed in a physical inspection? Uh, mm, Hinton? Um, I don't know what to say. I'd say um, you're going to have to get there sooner or later. You, there's so much open room for error when you write the report hours at, when you write the report at night after dinner, right? You're tired. You want to go to bed. And now you got to write a report. Uh, got to get that report up. You know, you promised the person 24 hours you'd have a report, which is another thing I beat my competitors on. An instant report is a heck of a lot better value than 24 hours later, isn't it? So I can email my client a summary of their inspection report as they're sitting in front of me, right? We can go over the report with, you should check out Spectora. Spectora is really good software. You turn the report, turn your laptop around, and the report's right there. It's in, um, interactive, too. Or you can email it instantly, right? They want the summary of the report quickly. You can do that with a click of a button. So I don't know. Trying to remember what are the tips on remembering what pictures you took six hours, eight hours? Like, I don't know. I would just focus on getting the software that works for you and then practice, practice, practice on your home, friend's home, parents, neighbors, Coworkers, anyone, do your home 10 times. I remember, still remember doing my home at least 20 times and crashing, crash and burn when you're, because you're going to, um, when it doesn't cost you anything. Or visit one of the House of Horrors, one in Boulder and one in Florida, and practice inspecting for defects using your software on the House of Horrors. Uh, wasn't there a double tap on that panel? There was, Jeff. There was actually. A ton of stuff wrong in that panel. There was a, a tap for the basement circuit right off the main lugs. Yep. So if you go back, you see that. Um, definition CY, that's not the point of, um, of this class, to find the defects that were, uh, I actually took a picture of. So, but yep, good, good call, Jeff. Um, definition of CYA, I don't know. Just a thought. Should the ladder be used by folding out the ladder? Add never lean again. I don't know what that means, Albert. Uh, when asked by a client, is it ethical to re recommend a certain contractor to do work that is needed on the home? When asked by a client, is it ethical to recommend a certain contractor? Okay, if not, how do you handle this? Um, I don't recommend contractors. I mean, the code of ethics um, is there for a reason. And... Um, I don't, I want to, um, I don't want even the appearance of violating the code of ethics to be associated with me, right? There's a lot of things you could do with the code of ethics, right? And get around, you know, talk about referrals and fees and gifts and working on things that you inspected or working on things that were beyond the scope. I don't touch any of that, right? I don't make any recommendations. To any contractor, right? And I certainly don't actually take referral fees, right? Um, so I don't even want the appearance of being improper and violating some kind of code of conduct. Not even the appearance. You're not even going to catch me, even coming close to the line. Um, thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Familiar. Uh, how do you instructors for the eight hours of field training in North Carolina? Uh, you go for North Carolina, it's naja.org slash North Carolina, one word. In fact, for any state or province or country that you're in, it's naja.org slash wherever you're from, one word. Um, does your iPhone software come with cloud upload? Yes. Yep. So Patrick, yep. Um, 
I, I would suggest that that is where this industry is going for inspection reports. They're all being uploaded to the cloud so that you can do video. Um, five years from now, I think a lot of inspection reports will be video based because there are tools right now that can transcribe your videos into text. So whatever you say in a video can be written out in a text. So we have both. I think that's where we're heading. I'm not sure. It's just a guess. But I certainly like videos. Um, Home Advisor, I have no comment. Uh, what's your opinion on providing radon testing? Um, it's fantastic. Uh, we have a partner called Rattlelink. Um, they have a great service. Um, we had testers out in the field all the time. It's a bit of a management juggling act. Um, but I had uh, our essentially our office manager um, be a part of that service. She would place or retrieve the radon test. If, if there was a home inspection scheduled, she would place the radon tests. And when I came there days later, no more than four days later, uh, I would retrieve them. So it's a bit of a management kind of thing. But radon, uh, that added 139 gross revenue, $139 to our uh, home inspection fee. 75% uh, of all home inspections um, for our company um, in Pennsylvania had a radon test. 50% uh, had a WDO, wood destroying organism test. And then it went down from there. Ancillary services, it's a great way to add gross revenue. Um, if you include your ancillary services, do you budget more time? Oh, no, right? You don't want to add more time. You have to think about your gross revenue as a fraction, right? So you want your gross revenue on the top divided by what? Your time. And you want your time as small as possible. You want that denominator to be as small as possible. You know? So if, it's, if you're taking a lot of time, you'll make less money per hour. So you want to not add more time. That's why you want to be efficient with your inspection and your report writing going mobile. And if you do uh, infrared, do I still have my infrared camera on? Let's see here. Yeah. So if you go infrared, I was a home inspector who included infrared for free, by the way. Included infrared for free. That's what I said. Because I never add, I always added value to my home inspection. Right? So I wouldn't sell an infrared scan as a separate, no one's going to buy an infrared scan for 50 or 100 bucks or 200 bucks or something like that. Well, not, not my clients, maybe yours. Yep, in your area, sure. You know, But my clients just wanted to hire a home inspector or valued hiring a home inspector who included infrared for free. So I remember the day that I bought an infrared camera for thousands of dollars because that's what they were many years ago. Now they're, this Clear C2 is just a few hundred for InterNACHI members. Um, and I had to increase my fee for my home inspection by 50 bucks so that I could pay off the infrared camera, right? And after I paid it off, then that was really good revenue, you know? Um, yeah, so I became the inspector who used infrared for free. Didn't charge for it, right? The perceived value of hiring me far exceeded the cost of hiring me. I had um, tall ladders. I took a ton of pictures, a ton of video. I used infrared, home maintenance book, homeowner newsletter, um, instant reporting, instant summary. All this added value for a low cost, right? So I just overwhelmed my clients with perceived value. So uh, yeah, so ancillary services is really great. And infrared just will take you uh, well beyond your competitors who don't have it. Um, thanks for the training. Uh, all right. Just a few questions about software. 
Um, what do you think about offering termite inspections as an additional service with your home inspection? Well, states regulate pesticide applicators, and within that certification regulation, there's um, wood destroying insect or wood destroying organism inspections. So the applicator thing was not for me. Right? I didn't go for that. I didn't become um, a regulated professional. Uh, licensed applicator, but I looked for anything that damages wood, including moisture, mold, bugs. So um, careful, careful. I provided a service that was valuable, that identified um, anything that was eating wood, essentially. And I put that in report, and I recommended that a licensed pesticide applicator follow my report and observations that I documented. Uh, right, so Rattling does not cover New Jersey. Uh, Patrick, yep, so, um, but we were talking about radon services being an ancillary service. Yep, uh, it's a great idea. Mold inspections, I still remember doing an inspection and finding the mold inspector come, and uh, they were charging almost as much as I was. They were just doing a couple samples, air samples, some swab stuff, in and out, less than an hour, making as much as me. So doing a mold inspection as an ancillary or standalone um, is probably a pretty good idea. And you can become uh, trained and certified by InterNACHI as a mold inspector, and it's all online and free for members. What's the average cost of a home inspection, Thomas? Uh, that all depends on where you are and what country you're in and, and all that. It's usually um, local. Unfortunately, um, there are areas where they are beating themselves up on uh, lowering the price. So, um, like Florida comes to mind. Um, so a lot of Florida inspectors um, do not know how to add value, distinguish themselves by providing value. So, um, and if you, if you all look the same, then the only distinguishing characteristic that a potential client will use to choose you from any other will be price and they'll choose the lowest price. Lowest price wins, and that's not good for anybody. So when all things are the same, they'll, they'll look at the lowest price. So you don't want to go there. You don't want to be the same as everybody else. You don't want to be that commodity, right? You want to be very different. So you work on your brand. And InterNACHI has a marketing team. There's seven folks, uh, highly trained, talented, creative people, in the marketing department that you can call and contact um, and ask for advice. And our marketing department provides free consultation and design services for anything related to your marketing, from something on your shirt to flyers and rack cards, business cards, logo design, things like that. Uh, customized home maintenance books. Um, we'll design all that stuff for free and we'll help you define what your brand is along the way. All right, I think that's it. That's almost two hours. Thank you for attending the class. Let me give you my email. There's my email, ben at internachi.org. Um, email me with any questions that you have. Go to Nachi TV, that top URL, and register for the next class. Thank you everybody for attending. I'll see you later, it was a lot of fun. I'll see you in class next time, bye.